welcome to lecture number 12 in numerics of machine learning. Uh, my name is Lukas. I'm a PhD student in Professor Hennig's group. And I'm going to talk about second order optimization for deep learning. So last week in Frank's lecture and also in the exercise, you have probably seen that um, deep learning of neural networks is pretty tedious and an extensive, um, expensive process. And today we're going to learn about a different class of optimizers, namely second order methods, that at least uh, don't have some of these um, problems that first order methods have. Um, yeah, so that's the plan for today. But we will also see that these specific optimizers have other difficulties and unsolved issues, um, especially in the context of deep learning that I want to address. So I want to start with um, a brief example. So this here is an example of a minimization problem. And you can see the so-called Rosenbrock function in 2D, uh, which is this banana-shaped function, uh, which has a, a global minimum at 1,1. Um, at one, one. And we start three optimizers at this initialization of the parameters. And here you can see basically the three trajectories of SGD with some learning rate, Adam and LBFGS. So maybe the first thing you notice is that for SGD and Adam, I need to specify some learning rate, right? So for those two, I have hyperparameters, and I tune them basically by hand just by trying out different values. And for LBFGS, apparently, I don't have to. Uh, I just use the default parameters, and apparently it works. So this is maybe one first observation from this little example. The next one is that if you take a look at the trajectories, then for SGD, we have this very jumpy behavior. So it seems to kind of surf this uh, very narrow valley. And it doesn't seem to make um, yeah, good progress, I would say. Whereas for Adam, this looks a little bit better, a bit more stable, because it seems to make more progress along the low curvature direction as well. And LBFGS just looks nice, in my opinion. It seems to make kind of well-informed steps. And it also seems to make only very few steps. So maybe one guess you could already have is um, that the convergence of LBFGS is faster than for the other two. So let's check if this is right. <coughs> so at the top plot here, um, I plotted the loss value, so the value of the function we're trying to minimize. And on the x-axis, we have the number of steps. So for LBFGS, I think it's seven steps until we reach the tolerance of 10 to the minus 8. For Adam, it's in the order of 1,000. And for SGD, it's in the order of 10,000. So yeah, um, it seems that um, SGD and Adam take many steps to reach the tolerance, whereas LBFGS only requires less than 10 steps. And now you could maybe argue that, um, OK, maybe it does less steps, but it could still be more expensive in terms of runtime, right? Because if every step is just much more expensive, then yeah, maybe it's just not worth it. But actually, it turns out that also in runtime, the difference is not uh, yeah, that large anymore as, uh, in terms of the number of steps. But still, um, LBFGS is much faster than Adam and certainly faster than SGD. So my question is, First of all, how do such methods work? And secondly, do they maybe also have potential for deep learning? Why don't we apply them to deep learning, right? So this is what I want to address in this lecture. And before we get to the fun, the interesting stuff, um, I want to briefly summarize and recap first order methods. But I'm going to go through this quite quickly. Um, because first of all, I think you have seen this in multiple lectures before and also last week in, uh, in parts by uh, Frank. So first of all, we have um, training data when we do deep learning. We have um, basically training examples of inputs x and outputs y. And we have this um, training set, which um, has n such examples. And these examples are assumed to come from um, a data generating process, basically. So a distribution uh, which is called pData. And we assume that we have IID samples from this distribution. Then we have a neural network or a model that makes predictions based on a parameter vector theta, which comes from this space, and an input which comes from this space. And this is then mapped to a c-dimensional output vector, 
which is basically a C is the number of classes, right? So uh, this is a vector of dimension C. And in the last step, we're going to compare this prediction, y hat, with the actual label from the training data, y. So um, this would be the loss function. So it takes those two things, maps it to a real number. And this is basically, so the loss is basically a measure of dissim dissimilarity, right, between the prediction and between the actual label. And now we can um, do this for the entire uh, distribution of data that we have. So the expected risk is defined as the expectation, um, basically um, taking samples from this data generating process and then taking the expectation over these numbers. Okay, so this would be the expected risk. And so the problem with this is, if this is our objective function, which we want to minimize, we cannot because we usually don't have access to this distribution. So what we do instead is we uh, compute a Monte Carlo estimator. Um, you should know about them from uh, Professor Hennig's lecture. So you can basically replace the expectation with an average, you could say. And we just plug in those numbers of the loss for samples coming from the distribution. This is basically the idea of a Monte Carlo estimator. So we end up with the empirical risk, the Monte Carlo estimator of the expected risk. And our goal in deep learning is to find a configuration of our network, so such a parameter vector theta that minimizes this empirical risk. Okay, I'm sure you know um, that there are uh, numerical methods for this, like gradient descent. So here the idea is pretty simple. We just go into the direction of the negative gradient because the negative gradient points into the direction of steepest descent, right? Um, so this is usually what, what first order methods do. They take the gradient and they um, compute the next iterate, in this case, theta k plus one. And in this case of gradient descent, this is the old parameter vector minus alpha times g. Alpha is the learning rate or step size, and g is the gradient of our target function, the expected risk. So in 2D, this would maybe look something like this. So the, the lines here are contour lines. So we have kind of a, a bowl-shaped function. And we start with some iterate theta k and go into this direction of the negative gradient. This would be the idea. Now, maybe most of you already see the problem. We have the same problem as before. We cannot really compute this gradient because we don't have access to the data generating process. So again, um, we can compute an, an estimate of this on finite data using a Monte Carlo estimate, which leads to stochastic gradient descent, SGD. So the idea is we can estimate this thing on finite data. So this could be training data. It could also be a um, which it is in practice, a mini batch of data, which is much smaller than the actual training data, and then compute a Monte Carlo estimator for the gradient, which looks like this. So it's, again, an average over individual gradients. And these individual gradients, uh, so there is one for each example in the mini batch, right? So for example, if we have three such um, examples, a batch size of three, then we get three individual gradients, as Frank has already uh, also shown you in the last lecture. And the average of these three orange arrows is this estimate g hat, okay? And a nice property of this gradient is that it's unbiased because it's a Monte Carlo estimator. It's uh, yeah, provably unbiased. And the SGD update then looks like this. Basically exactly the same as gradient descent, just with a stochastic gradient. And the efficiency of such methods can be improved if we use, for example, uh, moving averages, so something like momentum, um, because then you get more robust estimates of, um, of the gradient, for example. And you can also try to incorporate higher moments of the gradient, so something like a second moment, for example, which is, for example, also done in Adam. So we compute uh, an estimate of the variance, basically. All right, so on this slide, um, I, I try to show you that gradient-based methods are sensitive to the condition number. So what is the condition number? It's simply the ratio of the maximum and the minimum directional curvature. And the condition number is denoted by kappa. And it is defined as L divided by mu. So L would be the maximum curvature and mu would be the minimum curvature in your, um, in your loss function. And let's assume for a bit that mu is larger than zero. I will later address this point um, in more detail. But 
here I want just to, to emphasize that if the condition number is large, it's, it's a problem for gradient-based methods. That's the point of the slide. So <coughs> if the large curvature in this, um, in this bowl-shaped function is the same as um, the small curvature, which means that we're in such a case here, then the gradient is actually a, um, a, a decent direction, I would say. So um, because it pretty much points into the direction of the minimum, so it's a good search direction, right? And if you have an appropriate um, learning rate, this is a good step and we make fast progress. Whereas if the situation looks more like this and we have a direction in which the curvature is large, so this would be this direction, and we have another direction in which the curvature would be very small, so in this direction the, the gradient barely changes because it's really flat, right? In this case, the condition number would be large, and you can see that the gradient doesn't really point into a good direction because it would basically move like orthog orthogonal to uh, the connection line to the minimum, and we won't make much progress here. And this intuition can be basically turned into a theorem uh, for the convergence of these methods. So in this case, for gradient descent. So if your function is L smooth and mu convex, which basically means that the maximum curvature is L and the minimum curvature is larger than zero, then gradients descend with some step size, one over L. So we need to specify the correct step size here, um, achieves this convergence. So the distance to the minimum in the next step is going to be smaller or equal to a constant factor times the current distance to the minimum. And this factor is smaller than 1. Let's again um, consider like, the different values of kappa. So if kappa is around 1, then this factor is around 0, which means that we basically converge in just one step. Whereas if this kappa is large, and we have an ill-conditioned problem, then this number here is going to be close to 1, and the reduction each step is only going to be very small. So we make um, small uh, progress, and therefore we have slow convergence. And the result is pretty much similar for SGD. It converges also linearly, which means that it also has this constant reduc reduction factor in each step, um, but it converges only in expectation, because this is now a stochastic process. Um, it doesn't really converge to the solution, but only to some like level determined by the noise in the gradients, and also at a slightly slower rate depending on how noisy the gradients are. But my point here is that gradient-based ba methods are basically sensitive to ill-conditioned problems. Now, maybe the question is, how can we improve these updates, right? What can we do to the gradient? How can we rescale it to make it better? So I would say what we should do is we should make a small step in this direction, for example, maybe up to here, which is basically saying we multiply by 1 over L, because L is the large curvature direction. Whereas in the small curvature direction, where we have curvature mu, we want to uh, also multiply or rescale the gradient in this direction with 1 over mu. Okay, because then if we do this, then we have a small update in this direction and a large update in this direction, and we would maybe get something that points more into the direction of the minimum. So what quantity am I describing if I say multiply by 1 over L or multiply by 1 over mu? Which quantity is that? Yes? Yeah, but we're not talking about variance here, but I mean, this would also uh, hold for the deterministic case, right? Yeah, it has to do with curvature, exactly. And maybe more precisely, it has to do with inverse, cur inverse curvature, right? Because I say multiply by 1 over L or multiply by 1 over mu. So what I'm describing here is a quantity that uh, is, or this quantity I'm describing is basically inverse curvature. So in order to reduce this or eliminate um, this dependency on the condition number, we have to introduce um, or access inverse curvature. And this leads directly to second order methods. <coughs> so 
With second order methods, I mean methods that use curvature or inverse curvature somehow to improve the steps. And the central quantity of second order optimization is the so-called Newton step. So um, I want to give a, a quick um, derivation here. So basically, this is all based on a quadratic Taylor approximation of the loss landscape around theta k. So we're going to try to approximate our loss function at our current iterate theta k with some quadratic function. And this quadratic function has a specific form, which is a constant plus a linear term in theta with the gradient and a quadratic term in theta with the Hessian of, um, of the loss function. And we're going to assume that the Hessian is positive definite. Again, I'm going to go into more details later. So basically what we're doing here is um, we compute a, a bowl-shaped function that serves as a proxy or an approximation of the actual target function. And now because this approximation has, has such a specific form, right, we, can, we have this precise form here, um, we can actually do minimization of this proxy uh, in closed form. So the idea for the Newton step is we could choose our next iterate, theta k plus 1, such that it's the argmin of the quadratic. Okay? So that basically means we go from here directly into the minimum of the quadratic function, and this would be the Newton step. And it's pretty easy to, um, yeah, to derive the, the closed form formula for the Newton step. Well, how do we minimize q? Um, we can simply do that by computing its gradient and setting it to zero, um, which is pretty straightforward. And because the Hessian is positive definite, it's also invertible, and we can write down the Newton step, um, which is exactly this quantity here. Okay, so we need access to inverse curvature and the gradient. Okay, this would be the Newton step. Any questions so far? Was the derivation clear? Am I boring you? <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so the Newton method can be much faster than a gradient-based method in certain situations. So for a Newton method, we actually get local quadratic convergence. So earlier, as a reminder, um, for the gradient-based methods or basic gradient-based methods like SGD or gradient descent, we get linear convergence, so convergence of this form. Whereas we can get quadratic um, convergence order for Newton's method. So if we have a um, target function which is twice differentiable and we have a Hessian which is Lipschitz continuous, it basically just means that the Hessian cannot change arbitrarily fast. Um, in a neighborhood of the solution, and the sufficient conditions have to be satisfied at this point, which means that the gradient is zero and that the Hessian is positive definite at this, uh, at this point. And if we are close enough to the solution already, then the sequence of Newton updates achieves quadratic convergence order. And here I try to compare them a little a bit visually, just for um, a bunch of example numbers, just to make this point. So um, I basically just compare linear convergence to quadratic convergence. And the data is the same for both plots. Um, just here I have the, uh, a linear scale on the number of steps, and here I have uh, the distance to the optimum currently. And you can see that it's basically a, a vertical line for um, the quadratic convergence, and it's a straight line for linear convergence because in a semi-logarithmic plot like we have here, um, if we have a constant reduction factor in each step, this is going to be a straight line in a, in a, a semi-log plot. But, I mean, we cannot really see what the, what the orange line is doing here, right? So um, I also plotted the number of steps in a logarithmic scale. And we can see that for, for this particular example, we would need something like 10 steps for a Newton and something like 1,000 steps for uh, a method with linear convergence. So my point is, Newton method can be really fast in certain situations. So on this slide, a little maybe an, an intermediate summary. So Newton methods seems great, right? 
it is, Ill con uh, it is uh, robust against ill-conditioned problems, so it doesn't have this dependency on the condition number. Uh, second order methods can be uh, uh, really fast to get quadratic convergence if you're um, initializing close enough to the optimum. In contrast to gradient-based methods, Newton steps have a natural length. So with that, I mean that um, in the proof for the convergence of gradient descent method, we needed, that, uh, we needed to specify the learning rate, basically. We needed the learning rate to be 1 over L. And uh, such a thing didn't appear in the convergence theorem for Newton, right? So apparently, Newton steps have a natural length scale and don't need this learning rate, at least in certain situations. And last but not least, they have a long success story and are the default choice in many scientific fields. So why don't we use them for deep learning? Why don't you use them for deep learning? Yes? Yeah, so the question is basically about uh, computability. And you said that it's easy for the gradient, but what about the Hessian? And it turns out that you can actually compute additional stuff in the backward pass, uh, like curvature information as well. Um, it comes at a price, but in principle, you can do it. Yes? I mean, the Hessian was a large neural network, it's just a large neural Yes. Like, I don't know, 100 million parameters. Exactly. Where yeah, that's a good point. So cost is a problem. How do we store such a metrics is a problem. More ideas. Yes? Sorry, can you repeat? They are stuck at local, local stuff. OK, but this is maybe also true for a gradient-based method, right? They could also converge to a local minimum. Yes? Yes, that's a good point. So Exactly. So. <clears throat> yeah, your point was that the Hessian is not necessarily positive definite, which means that we basically have a non-convex problem. And then what is the Newton step? We're going to uh, take a look at this as well. Um, maybe one point that didn't come up yet. Um, if you think about um, the difference between gradient descent and SGD, there is a difference, right? So stochasticity, exactly. So I would say these are the three main problems for applying second order methods to deep learning. Non-convexity, how do we deal with a non-convex objective function, which usually we have in deep learning? What about the cost? Uh, how can we access, store, and invert even uh, huge curvature matrices? And the third point is about stochasticity. So how can we handle stochasticity? And in the following, I, in the rest of the lecture, basically, I want to go through these three problems with you and give you, uh, or try to give you uh, an, an overview of the ideas that exist for these problems. So of course, I cannot go into the technical details for, uh, for every method, but I'm rather trying to give you some rough idea of the concepts um, that are applied. Question? Um, with stochasticity, I mean, so if you have, usually you cannot um, compute those quantities you want precisely, right? If you want to compute the precise Newton step, you need a precise Hessian and the precise gradient. And because we cannot compute those quantities for the expected loss, we have to estimate them, right? Like we uh, had to for SGD, for example. And this can have a very, um, a very strong effect on the performance of these methods. And we should at least know how they are affected by noise if we want to apply them in these situations. All right. <coughs> So let's start with uh, the first point, non-convexity. How can we deal with non-convex objective functions? So earlier we assumed that the Hessian is positive definite, right? When we derive the Newton step. And the question is, why? So I would say it's pretty much clear that we cannot allow eigenvalues to be zero, because if we have a zero eigenvalue, then the Hessian is simply not invertible, and we have a problem. Because then the Newton step does also not exist, right? But why didn't we allow negative eigenvalues? So if we consider a cut through the quadratic model along the corresponding normalized eigenvector, so we're going to take this quadratic model, this bowl-shaped function, and we basically uh, restrict it to uh, viewing at it over a line segment, 
And um, so we get a, a one-dimensional function, right? And um, here I'm basically uh, showing you how this function looks like. So we're going to start from our current iterate, and we go into the direction of the eigenvector e um, with some, you could say, step size tau. So we're going to consider this as a function of tau. And if you now just plug in the numbers for the quadratic model, uh, you can write it in this form. And now the interesting bit is the curvature. So um, we have h times e. e is an eigenvector. So h times e is the same as lambda times e. We can pull lambda in front because it's simply a scalar. And we are left with e transpose e. And because I assume that it's a normalized eigenvector, this is the squared norm, which is just 1. So we can simplify to this thing. And if we consider this as a function of tau, this is simply a quadratic function, right? It's simply a parabola, which makes sense because a cut through a multi-dimensional quadratic is a parabola. It kind of makes sense. But the interesting thing, again, is um, so, so first of all, this is a parabola, right, in tau with a constant curvature lambda. So if you compute the second derivative of this fun function with respect to tau, it's going to be lambda. And this is nice because it gives us an intuition between the connection of eigenvalues and curvature. So if you consider a cut through a quadratic function along some eigenvector, the curvature along this direction is going to be the eigenvalue. So I think this is a nice intuition. Um, and in this specific case, <coughs> we assumed that this lambda is negative, right? We want to know what happens if we take negative eigenvalues. So think about how this parabola looks like if this curvature is negative. It's bent downwards, right? So f if we take a large enough tau, if we let this go to infinity, the quadratic model is simply unbounded from below which means that the Newton update is meaningless because it was fundamentally based on the idea of minimizing this quadratic. And now if I have a negative eigenvalue, then this quadratic does not have a minimum. So in this case, like you uh, correctly said, um, it doesn't work, right? And in deep learning, <coughs> the problem is that usually the, the Hessian is indefinite. So that there are positive and negative eigenvalues. So the Newton step is meaningless. So what can we do to address this problem? <coughs> so one idea you could have is, so the problem seems to be the Hessian, right? So maybe we can just use a different quantity. And one example of such a quantity is the GGN, which is the generalized Gauss-Newton matrix, or GGN in short. And as we're gonna, gonna see, this is a positive semi-definite approximation to the Hessian and we can basically use it as a replacement of the Hessian. So here I want to give a little derivation. So the GGN kind of arises when we take a look at how the Hessian decomposes using this split. So the loss function is basically, or if you want to compute the loss, what you do is basically you take the parameter vector theta, you map it through your, or you um, apply it to your model, and then you're going to take the model outcome and apply your loss function, right? So this is kind of a two-step process. And um, the derivation for the GGN is based on applying the chain rule to this split. And because all those quantities are vectors and matrices, it's a little bit uh, difficult. And you would actually need something like um, matrix differential calculus to do that properly. But I still want to give you like, the, the rough idea of how the derivation works. So if we now compute the gradient of the loss, and we want to do this with chain rule according to the split, the idea would be to compute the derivative of the loss with respect to f, and then of f with respect to theta. So this would be the chain rule, right? And this is exactly what happens here. So if we want to compute the first derivative of the loss with respect to theta, we first take the derivative of the loss with respect to f, so with respect to the first argument, and then we take the uh, derivative of f with respect to the parameter theta. So this is basically simply how chain rule works, just that it looks a little bit more difficult here because we have those matrix uh, quantities here. <coughs> 
So J would simply be the Jacobian of the model with respect to theta. Okay, now if we want to do this another time, we can. And because we have this product here, we basically need to apply the product rule. Okay, so how did product rule work again? So we fix the first thing and just compute the derivative of the second, which will give rise to this term. And then we'll do it the other way around. And we're gonna compute the derivative of this term and multiply with, uh, so we, we fix this quantity. And this is what happens here in the second line. So here we just copy the Jacobian transpose and then compute the derivative of this thing with, with uh, respect to the parameters and we can apply chain rule again. So in order to compute the derivative of this with respect to theta, you can compute the second derivative of the loss with respect to f and then multiply again with the Jacobian. So this is simply chain rule another time. And for the other thing, we have to uh, compute now the derivative of this matrix, which is, yeah, a little bit hard because as I said, you would actually need matrix differential algebra to do this properly. But basically the idea is to fix one output of the model F, then this mapping is basically, um, so F would be, uh, if you fix one component, it's just a real number and we can compute second derivatives. And then this is basically simply the, the Hessian um, with respect to theta of the model, but only this, the C comp the component of this model. And we multiply with the uh, Cth component of the gradient vector of F with respect to, uh, of, of the loss with respect to F. So maybe this was a bit confusing, but uh, the core idea is basically to consider the loss function as this split into uh, first applying the model and then applying the loss function and applying chain rule to the split. This is the core idea. And you can see that <coughs> the Hessian then kind of um, yeah, decomposes into two parts. The first part is gonna be what we uh, define as the GGN. And the remaining part is just a residual that kind of makes a difference between GGN and Hessian. But the GGN is now defined as this quantity, so just the first part. But this would only be the GGN for one particular training example, so for one input-output pair x, y. And exactly the same as for the Hessian, um, we're gonna define this quantity as the expectation over the data generating process of this product of Jacobian. Um, this is the Hessian of the loss with respect to F and the Jacobian again. Okay, so this is the GGN. And a little bit of intuition what this, or well, how this matrix is different from the Hessian is the GGN neglects curvature from the model because it basically just says, okay, I ignore this, this entire second term. And this second term contains second derivatives of the model with respect to theta. So we're basically neglecting curvature information coming from the model rather than from the loss. And a different way to say this is if the model F is linear in theta, then the Hessian would be zero, right? The second derivative of a linear function is zero. So this term would drop out anyway. And in this case, Hessian and GGN coincide. So if you consider a linearization of your model in theta, um, then GGN and Hessian are actually the same quantity. Okay, so now why did we do all this? I mean, the point of this was that we need something that is positive definite, right? And now let's check if this is actually the case. So on this slide, I um, want to show you two main properties of the GGN. First of all, it's symmetric. So if you consider G transpose, which is simply the expectation we just saw, I omitted this uh, distribution because I didn't want to clutter up the slide. Um, but yeah, the expectation is still over the um, X and Y coming from the data generating process. And um, we take the expectation transpose. And because the expectation of a matrix is defined element wise, it doesn't make a difference if you pull the transpose inside or not. So we can do that. And now apply, apply the rules that go for the transpose. So we have the Jacobian transpose in front, then the Hessian transpose in the middle, and Jacobian transpose, transpose, so Jacobian at the right. So we arrive at this quantity. And now the Hessian is uh, symmetric because second derivatives are symmetric, right? So we arrive again at G. Okay. 
So it turns out the GGN is symmetric. Now let's check if it is also positive semi-definite. So let's apply a vector from the left and the right, some vector v, to the GGN. Then this is simply uh, uh, plugging in the definition. We can pull the vectors inside of the expectation because they are just constants, right? We can pull them inside and outside of the expectation because of its linearity. And then we can basically group those Jacobian vector products together. And this is inside the expectation is um, equal or larger to zero if this Hessian is positive semi-definite, right? And if we take the expectation, this property still holds. So the question that is um, left is, is this Hessian actually a positive semi-definite? And it turns out for basically all relevant loss functions, it is. And um, maybe this is most obvious if we consider the mean squared error loss. So in this case, the loss would simply be uh, uh, computing the norm squared between the outputs of the model and the true label. And this norm is squared. <coughs> and in this case, the Hessian would be a scalar times the identity matrix. So it clearly is positive definite. And that means this property basically also transfers to the GGN. And the GGN is positive semi-definite, which is exactly what we wanted. Yes? Um, uh, I think you could still compute something like the GGN for that. The, uh, but I mean, it's, it's really, it's fundamentally based on the split. So if you don't have the split, I'm not sure if it's still well defined. Um, yeah, we'll, we will Mm -hmm. So one thing that, that, I, that I can think of is maybe compute the GGN still for the loss function and simply compute the Hessian of your regularizer. Because if, for example, for L2 regularization, this is simply an identity matrix, right? And then you could maybe have something like GGN plus parameter times identity, which is simply damping. And we're going to talk about this a bit later. Um, so this is maybe one thing you can do. But I think like in this definition, it's, it requires the split of model and loss function. <clears throat> All right, so this is one possibility um, for replacing the Hessian with a GGN because in this case is positive semi-definite, right? And um, it gives us a, a well-defined Newton step. And there is also another matrix which is called the Fisher information matrix. So <clears throat> assuming that you can write your loss function as a uh, negative log likelihood. So this is, for example, true if you have um, um, a softmax and a cross-entropy loss, then your, mo your model basically describes a distribution over the classes because you get this, this vector of dimension C and it's basically a distribution over, um, yeah, as I said, the classes. And in this case, you can define the Fisher information matrix as this quantity and at this point, I don't want to go into the details, but this matrix is also positive semi-definite, and maybe I can try to give some uh, intuition. So <clears throat> if you replace the Hessian with the Fisher and compute a Newton step, then this is steepest descent in distribution space. So what does this mean? So um, one way to think about it is steepest is basically a ratio, right? If, if you're talking about how steep a function is, it's basically a ratio, and it's a ratio of a difference between two function values and a difference between two parameter vectors. And with this uh, ratio, you can basically s say how uh, steep the decrease in the function is. But this notion of steepness depends on the metric you apply to your parameter space. So for example, if you say, my parameter space, I want to apply the Euclidean metric, then what comes out of it is it's just a gradient descent because the negative gradient points into the direction of steepest descent. But you could also use a different metric for measuring distance between two parameters. And because we have this interpretation uh, that the parameter basically models uh, 
distribution, we could also say we want to measure the distance between two parameter vectors by measuring the distance between the two distributions, for example, in kullback leibler divergence. And when you do that, then the steepest descent is actually this step, so the Fisher inverse times the gradient. So this is what I mean by steepest descent in distribution space. It's basically applying uh, kullback leibler divergence to the distributions. Yes? So, so that, that would change the uh, output Sorry, say again? So that, taking that step, mm -hmm. Yes, the, the, most. the most in some way, yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. Okay, and there is a strong connection between the Fisher information matrix and the TGN because in many cases, for example, softmax versus entropy classification, those two matrices are exactly the same. Okay, so <coughs> we have solved the, the problem, I would say, kind of, because we have found like reasonable, meaningful curvature proxies we can use instead of the Hessian and we get a well-defined Newton step. But even in the convex case, even if the Hessian was positive definite, we have still one problem. And the problem is that the quadratic model can be arbitrarily bad. So if you consider this problem here, um, so a one-dimensional visualization, we have the loss function in black, and we have the quadratic approximation shown in blue. And clearly, if we minimize this function and go to this point, it's not a good step because we actually not decrease the loss, but rather increase it even. And this is maybe something that we want to avoid. And this leads to uh, uh, the trust region problem and damping. So the idea is basically to restrict the updates to lie within some radius r. So basically a radius in which we trust our quadratic approximation to be uh, precise. And then the trust region problem is uh, we're still going to define the next iterate as the argument of the quadratic, but under an additional constraint that we don't move too far away from our current iterate. We want to stay within this trusted radius, basically. And this leads to a modified Newton step, which you can see here. So basically, the thing that changed is that we can simply add um, delta times identity. So delta is simply a, a scalar and this is the identity matrix, and we add this to the curvature matrix for some delta larger or equal to zero. And with damping, we can basically interpolate between gradient descent and the full Newton step. So if you take delta equals zero here, then this is simply the Newton step, right? And if you make delta really, really large, then this term in the sum is kind of dominated by the identity, and we can forget about the Hessian. And now what is delta times identity inverse? Well, it's just one over delta. So we're left with next iterate is current iterate minus one over delta times gradient, which is simply gradient descent with a small learning rate, right? And basically with damping, we can interpolate between those two extremes, between the full Newton step and gradient descent with a very small step size. So with damping, we can basically control how conservative we want our updates to be. And now the question, of course, is how can we choose the radius? And um, it turns out that even if we could change a reasonable radius, then, oh, sorry. Uh, even if we could uh, define a reasonable radius, then it would be really hard to compute the corresponding delta because, I mean, this delta depends on the choice of radius, right? And it's easier actually to work with the damping directly in a heuristic way. So for example, there is this uh, levenberg marquardt heuristic and it's basically based on the so-called reduction ratio. So it compares two things. It compares how much, um, so if my quadratic model is correct, what decrease in the loss function do I expect when I take this step, which would be the distance from going from here to there and it compares this to the actual reduction of the loss function. So in this case, the jump from here to there. And um, depending on how well those two numbers match, it will adapt the damping. So for example, if they are pretty much the same, that means that our quadratic model is a good approximation of the loss function, then the damping will stay the same. Whereas for example, in this case, the reduction that we expect is uh, 
much larger than the, expect, uh, than the reduction that we get. So in this case, we would certainly increase the damping by some factor. So this is basically how this heuristic would work. So here I want to try to give an answer to the question we had. How can we deal with non-convex objective function? And I think the answers that we can give are pretty concrete in this case. So instead of the Hessian, we can compute positive semi-definite curvature matrices like the GGN and the Fisher. They provide meaningful curvature proxies. Um, so, I mean, they have some, there is some intuition behind them. We can interpret them. And often they are even the same, which is also nice. And it's pretty easy to give um, unbiased estimators of both of these matrices on finite data. So we can basically replace uh, the expectation by uh, a Monte Carlo estimator for both cases pretty easily. And the second thing we talked about is damping, so we can control how conservative updates uh, we want to be. And using damping heuristics like levenberg marquardt um, this actually works pretty nicely in, in practice. So I would say for this question, we have pretty much concrete answers. So let's move to the next problem, cost. <coughs> So the question here is, how can we access and invert these huge curvature matrices? So to illustrate this problem, I have a little uh, example. So if we, for example, consider the all CNNC network, which has 1.4 million parameters, which is, I would say, in modern times, uh, maybe a moderate size of a neural network, maybe even small, um, then the Hessian requires to store these squared numbers, right? It's a matrix. And if for each number we need four bytes, so if we want to store this as a float, we would have to store 8,000 gigabytes. So I don't know what uh, like, uh, machines you have, but I don't have a machine where I can store or even invert such a matrix. So um, what can we do about this? So the problem here is uh, storage is O of t squared, and inversion, at least in the upper bound, is cubically in cost. So how can we do this? And um, for this question, I would say we don't have to reinvent the wheel, right? We can basically borrow ideas from linear algebra. Because, I mean, for example, from Marvin's lecture and also from uh, Jonathan Zwenger lecture, um, there are certain ideas we can just use. For example, we could use a low rank approximation of the Hessian, which leads to something like uh, BFGS or LBFGS. We can use iterative methods that um, so something like CG, conjugate gradients, which leads to Hessian-free optimization. And we could use uh, structured approximations, so approximations that make use of the structure of the curvature matrix, which leads to something like KFAC. Um, so in the following, um, I would like to briefly show you how these uh, ideas work. So let's start with BFGS. So the core idea of BFGS is that we want to gradually learn an approximation to the inverse Hessian from gradient observations. So there's a lot of stuff going on in this statement. So first of all, it's a, great, uh, it's a gradual process. So it's an iterative process where we step by step learn how the Hessian or the inverse of the Hessian looks like. Um, it can actually, so I deliberately put learn here because you can um, actually see this as an inference process in the, the Bayesian framework. And it's an approximation to the inverse Hessian, so not the Hessian, but the inverse Hessian directly. And I'm going to show you how this works. And this is going to be based on gradient observations. Okay, So we're not going to actually compute curvature information here but we kind of gonna deduce from gradient observations how the inverse Hessian will look like. And how does this work? So I brought another uh, visualization in 1D. So if you think about the situation where you have two parameter vectors, or in this case numbers, theta k, theta k plus one, and you can evaluate the gradient at both positions. So this is the gradient, right? Not the target function, but the gradient. Now, if the question is, can you give an approximation of the curvature, so this, the, the, um, the curvature of L, so the first derivative of the gradient, right? 
And how can we approximate first derivatives? Well, we can use the secant, which is this green line, and compute the slope of this function. And the slope of this function is simply yk divided by sk. So basically a finite difference approximation to the gradient function, which gives rise to the second derivative. Is this clear? Okay, I see some nodding. Uh, and basically the same idea, uh, you can basically transfer this idea also to the multidimensional case. So if you multiply this by sk, then it just goes to the other side, and we arrive exactly at the so-called secant equation. So we have yk, which is the difference in the two gradients. We have sk, which is the difference in the parameter vectors. And here we have the Hessian matrix. And now, if we uh, want to get to a BFGS, we basically, or the idea is, so we want an approximation of the inverse Hessian, right? So we're gonna take properties from the actual inverse Hessian, and we're gonna require our approximation to have the same properties. That's, what I would say, a reasonable idea. <coughs> so the first um, constraint we will have on um, our approximation to the inverse, which is denoted by B, is that it fulfills the secant equation for inverse. So here I have the secant equation for the actual Hessian, and if you multiply this from the left with the inverse Hessian, you get inverse Hessian yk is sk, which is basically the yeah, secant equation in the variant for the inverse Hessian, not for the Hessian, but yeah, the idea is still the same. Um, also, we know that the Hessian is symmetric, which means that the inverse Hessian is also symmetric. So we're gonna require our approximation bk plus one to also be symmetric. And lastly, we're gonna require our approximation to not, or to, to change, um, the, the changes should be as small as possible between two iterates. And these conditions actually give rise to the B, um, BFGS update. So <coughs> you can write, uh, write down a recursive formula for how to construct these approximations to the inverse Hessian and these updates only involve the previous approximation and the vectors sk and yk, right? So um, basically that's the idea, yes? This one? Yeah. yeah. So yk is a vector, right? So in this case, it's uh, supposed to be a one-dimensional quantity, but yes, in general, it's a vector, yeah. And sk is also a vector? Yes. So this is just for uh, the 1D case, and this is for the multidimensional case, because like you said, uh, this, this formula simply doesn't make sense for vectors. So this is simply to explain why the form in the multidimensional case looks as it looks, um, not as a proper derivation, because I just wanted to make the, the core idea clean, uh, clear, uh, because deriving this would be more complicated. Yes. How would A good question. So usually this is initialized as uh, a multiple of the identity matrix because what else do you do, right? Uh, but yeah, it, I'm, I, am, I am not completely sure. So I know that this is like the default choice, but there may be cases where you want a different initialization. So some kind of um, better approximation to the inverse already, um, if you can compute it, than just the identity matrix. Basically some, yeah, you could phrase it this way, yeah. All right. <clears throat> so now we still have a problem because this matrix BK, so the approximation to the inverse Hessian is still D times D, right? And in general, it's a dense matrix, so no sparsity. And we still have to store it. So the idea of, um, or the, the insight that is important here is that at iteration K, this approximation is the result only of B0 B and the entire history of those vectors SK and the vectors YK. So if we store those vectors, we can basically recursively construct this matrix. And the idea of LBFGS is that we can still get a good curvature approximation, or uh, sorry, approximation to the inverse Hessian, BK hat, by only using the most recent curvature information so we're not gonna use the entire history of vectors sk and yk going from 
like the current iteration back to zero, but only like a fixed uh, window of some fixed size L. And with this, the claim is that we can still get uh, um, a good curvature estimate. And that means that we have less memory consumption because now we only have to store two L vectors instead of two K. And um, yeah, so if L is reasonably small, in some cases it's even one, um, this is much cheaper than storing the entire matrix. And I mean, ultimately we also, um, we, we want to compute a Newton update, right? So we want to uh, apply this approximation of the inverse to the gradient. And it turns out that there is also an efficient algorithm for that, which is called the LBFGS two loop recursion. But at this point, I cannot go into the details, but just wanted to let you know that there is a specifically designed procedure that is very efficient to uh, apply this matrix to the gradient. <clears throat> so next I want to talk about Hessian free optimization. So the core idea here is to basically use CG for minimizing the quadratic because CG is like, it's specifically designed for minimizing quadratic functions, right? So this is exactly the case maybe where we want to apply it. And the nice thing about uh, CG is that it only requires us to do matrix vector products um, and not actually so we don't need the, the, the curvature matrix to be in memory explicitly. We only need to be able to multiply with this matrix. And it turns out that, so the Hessian free approach that is described in this paper actually uses the GGN, which is a little bit confusing um, because it's called Hessian free optimization. But uh, it uses the GGN as curvature matrix and we can multiply with the GGN without ever building it in memory explicitly. And this is why it's called also a matrix-free approach. Now the idea is, so for a given input-output pair, we want to compute the product between the GGN and some vector, right? Because this is what we do in CG. We have to multiply the curvature matrix with some vector. And for only one in, uh, input-output pair, so if we use the kind of Monte Carlo estimator for the GGN only on one data point, uh, the GGN would look like this, okay? And I want to use this uh, setting for uh, this uh, simple example. And the matrices are C times D and the Hessian is C times C. So the matrices look a little bit like this. So D is the number of parameters in our vector, uh, in our network, so this is gonna be a very large number. Whereas C is at least compared to D often very small. So the thing we want to compute looks approximately like this. Now, how do we do these matrix, matrix or matrix vector products? So the, like, the, the naive thing to do would be to just follow this rule and compute J transpose times Hessian times J, but then we are screwed because then this is a D times D matrix, right? So how would you compro uh, compute these, this product? Between those two, uh, between those four objects, yes. Exactly. Can you uh, explain briefly why this is a good idea? Yeah, because if you first multiply J by D, then it uh, defines uh, what is the D? <laughs> uh, no, so J, trans uh, J times V would actually be. Uh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So you basically only have to, uh, you only have those tiny vectors of size C that you have as intermediate results. Um, and at no point you have this D times D matrix in memory explicitly, which is nice. But still, um, you could think that, okay, but I need somehow to have access to the Jacobian and this matrix. And the Jacobian is also C times D, right? It's quite large. So we need some way to efficiently multiply the Jacobian with a vector or Jacobian transpose with a vector and so on. We need to do these matrix vector products efficiently. <coughs> and I am no expert on, on autodiff, but I'm still gonna try to uh, explain the core idea of how this can be done efficiently. So we don't have to construct these matrices explicitly. And as an example, we consider the first operation. So we're gonna um, 
try to figure out an efficient way to compute Jacobian times vector. So the core idea is to replace the Jacobian vector product, which we want to compute, by, I, by a directional derivative. And this is how it's going to work. So we basically compute or we consider a linearization of our model. Okay? So this is simply a Taylor approximation. We approximate f at, th uh, at theta plus delta theta by f of theta plus the Jacobian times delta theta, and we have some error term. Okay, now here appears the Jacobian vector product, but we don't want this to be delta theta, right? We want this to be v. So maybe we can sneak the vector inside there and um, yeah, try to see, uh, try to see what's happen happening. So we're gonna set delta theta to r times v. So r is a small constant, a scalar, and v is gonna be this vector that we want to multiply with. And then you can rearrange the terms, and it turns out that you can write it this way. So uh, j times v is this difference between two functions divided by r, and we have this error term. In principle, you could already use this approximation as an approximation to the Jacobian vector product, right? Because you would simply have to evaluate the function two times, divide by r, and you get an estimate of the Jacobian vector product. But it turns out that this is numerically very really unstable. So on the one hand, you want this error term to be small, so you want this r to be small. But if r is small, you divide by a small number, and these two vectors are also quite similar for small numbers. So you get numerical cancellation and your stability gets uh, screwed. So um, we don't want to use this finite difference approximation, but something else. But now, if we consider this as a function in R, we basically have some function evaluated at R minus some function evaluated at zero divided by R. Now, if we let R go to zero, this is a derivative, right? So for r going to zero, we obtain Jacobian vector product is simply the derivative of this function with respect to r, evaluated at r equals zero. And this is an operation that you can actually implement very efficiently in um, uh, an autodiff library like uh, PyTorch. And it turns out that you can implement all those three vectors very efficiently without ever having one of those matrices in memory explicitly. So this can be, very, can, can be done very efficiently using those autodiff tricks, basically. All right, so that's it for Hessian free optimization. We saw that the core idea was applying CG. And we can uh, use additional autodiff uh, tricks to even make those individual matrix vector products um, very efficient. <coughs> So as a last technique, I want to uh, present KFAC, which is the chronic affected approximate curvature. And this is based on the Fisher information matrix, so it tries to build an estimate for that uh, matrix. And it's basically based on two approximations. The first one is a block diagonal approximation. So we assume that um, the Fisher, or we, um, yeah, we will use an approximation such that the Fisher matrix uh, has this block diagonal structure where it has one block for each layer, which basically means that we will neglect curvature interactions between layers. This is the first approximation, and it's reasonable because it makes inverting this matrix trivial when you can invert the blocks, right? So the, invert, uh, the inverse of this matrix is gonna have the same block diagonal structure, but it's gonna have the um, block in inverses on the diagonal. So if we can compute those, it's easy to invert the, um, this matrix F hat. And the second approximation is that we exchange two operations, taking the expectation and the Kronecker product. So what I mean by that is for a linear layer, the block can actually have, or can actually be written precisely in this form. So this is not an, an approximation, it actually has this form. And so it's an expectation over a Kronecker product over two things. 
over these two um, vectors. And this is approximated using, first of all, the expectation over the first thing, then the expectation over the th second thing, and then computing the chronicle product of the two. So this is where the approximation happens. And this is also reasonable because if we can write the block as this product of two uh, matrices, um, then inversion of the block is really easy. So if we want to compute the inverse of the block, then, I mean, according to our approximation, so this actually shouldn't be an equal sign, it should be an approximate sign because of this approximation. But um, we can plug in the form for the block, which is AI chronicle BI. And now we have this nice property of the chronicle product that we can basically pull the inverse operator inside and we get AI inverse chronicle factor BI inverse. And these two matrices are tiny, right? So compared to the block and the entire matrix, these two uh, components, AI and BI, are really small and inverting them can actually be done. So basically, the cost of storing and inverting F comes down to storing and inverting those components AI and BI, right? Because from them, you can basically build the entire matrix and also uh, it's easy to construct the inverse. So that's it for KFAC. Uh, let me summarize again. So uh, how can we access and invert the curvature matrix? That was the question we started with. Uh, we saw three approaches. And what I'm trying to do on this slide is, first of all, give you a little summary, but also try to give you certain pros and cons for the different things, uh, which sometimes are also based on a personal um, experience or what I know from colleagues, but don't cite me on that, okay? So um, for BFGS and LBFGS, this is basically a dynamic low rank approximation of the Hessian, and it's actually the default choice for small deterministic problems. So for example, if you call scipy optimize minimize, that's gonna be using BFGS or LBFGS. So for example, if you have a really small network and noise is not so much of an issue, for example, because you only have few data points and you can basically uh, compute the um, estimates very precisely, then it might actually be worth a shot to try out BFGS or LBFGS um, to solve this problem because they can actually be really fast in certain cases. Next, we also discussed the Hessian free optimizer, which is quite close to the notion of Newton steps. Uh, so for BFGS, we had this uh, approximation by only a few vectors. And in KFAC, we had this chronicle factorization, uh, the block diagonal, and uh, so these different approximations. And in the Hessian free approach, we don't have those approximations, right? We take the GGN instead of the Hessian, but apart from that, we don't apply any further approximations. So it's actually quite close to the notion of the classical Newton step. It requires little memory. Uh, so I mean, we don't have to store any vectors, like for example, for LBFGS or for KFAC, we have to store those uh, chronic factors. But instead we have more sequential work because we use an iterative approach. So if we do a lot of CG iterations, this is also quite costly. And the Hessian free seems to require larger mini batch sizes, which is problematic if you have batch norm layers. So this is a little a bit of a complicated story, and I experienced this myself, unfortunately. So uh, the problem is if you want to uh, use larger mini batches. So for example, the authors of this paper by Martens, um, they used something like in the order of 5,000 as mini batch size for an uh, I think an auto encoder on MNIST. And if you have such large mini batch sizes you have to uh, kind of split the computation into uh, um, chunks of data you can actually handle. So for example, if you want to compute the gradient on a large mini batch, uh, you, you uh, take chunks of data which, for which you can compute the gradient and then you aggregate the results to compute the entire gradient, okay? But this is kind of based on the assumption that if you take one mini batch and compute the gradient, the result should be the same if you split this mini batch into, for example, two parts and feed them through your network separately, compute individual two gradients and aggregate those two, right? This should be the same. And if you apply a batch norm, it's not. So this is gonna be a problem. And unfortunately, so batch norm is still used a lot. And if you want to use Hessian free with large batch sizes and batch norm, 
you're going to have uh, a problem. Yeah. So the last thing we discussed is uh, KFAC. It's basically a lightweight representation of the Fisher information matrix. It's widely used, for example, also in uncertainty quantification. And Philip will uh, talk about this next week. And the KFAC optimizer, as my last point, uh, heavily rel relies on a heuristic damping. So this paper by uh, Frederick Benzing um, basically gave evidence that um, the KFIC optimizer is actually more similar to a first order method than to a second order method. And um, it attributes the good performance of KFIC more or less exclusively to the heuristic damping that is used in this, um, in this uh, optimizer. So it's actually questionable if KFIC uh, still contains or to, to what extent KFAC, this approximation, still contains information from the actual fissure because of those ap approximations that are made there. So I would say in summary, um, we have some pragmatic approaches like engineering style approaches to uh, this question we had earlier, uh, which all have their specific pros and cons. Now, uh, finally, I want to address this last problem, which is stochasticity. So here the problem is we want to compute the Newton step. So we would like to invert the Hessian and apply it to the gradient, but we only have estimates thereof. So we can only compute an estimate of the Hessian and an estimate of the gradient. Now, because we have finite data, right, we cannot uh, access this data generating process. So how does this change um, things? So <clears throat> even if you have unbiased stochastic estimates, so in expectation, this is the gradient, and in expectation, this is the Hessian, so they are unbiased. But even if we use unbiased stochastic estimates, the Newton step will be biased. So if we consider the expectation over the stochastic Newton step, so this is the thing we actually can compute, it turns out that here is a not equal, and on the right, we have the thing we actually want to compute. Now, why is that? <clears throat> so, uh, first of all, the expectation factorizes if those two things are independent of each other, right? So, for example, if we take one mini batch to compute the gradient and one mini batch to compute the Hessian, then this uh, expectation factorizes and we can actually split this computation into two parts, computing the expectation of the inverse Hessian and computing the expectation over the gradient. And this is not the same as pulling the inverse out of the expectation. We will see in a bit why this is the case. Um, but then this is actually the same as the Newton step because we assume that we have unbiased estimates for H hat, uh, for unbiased estimates for H and G. But the, th the point where it definitely goes wrong is this one. Okay. So the my claim here is that a stochastic Newton step is biased. So in expectation, it's not correct. And I also want to, um, or I, I will try to provide some intuition for this problem also in 1D. So let's assume a very simple case. So we assume that G hat and G is simply one. So the gradient and the noise on the gradient is not an issue. So the question boils down to, uh, why is the expectation over one over H hat not the same as the uh, one over H, right? This is kind of the question if we uh, consider this one dimensional case. So why is there no equal sign between those two quantities? This is the question. <coughs> so let's try to understand this in 1D. <coughs> so we have an estimate of the curvature so this is actually a distribution, right? It's, it uh, has some uncertainty. And this is shown as the screen distribution. And in expectation, our, um, our estimate is correct. So in expectation, we're going to get h. Now, if we map h through this inverting function, so the inverting function is simply taking the in, uh, inverse of the argument. So in 1D, this is simple, right? We can just do write down the, the fraction. Um, then mapping h through this function is going to give 1 over h. So this is the thing that we actually want to compute. Now, what is the thing we actually get? 
So if we consider this green distribution and we consider it as um, a left half and a right half, then uh, mapping the right half through this function will not change a lot of the, uh, of the shape of the distribution, right? But if we map the left part of the distribution, which, com which comes close to zero, if we map this through this inverting function, then it's going to distort the, uh, the interval a lot. So if we map this distribution through the inverting function, then it will actually uh, break the symmetry, and we get this heavy tail if this distribution comes close to zero. And that means, because of this heavy tail, the expectation, expectation is moved to uh, above, right? So uh, in expectation, our estimate of the inverse curvature is going to be too large. This is basically what I'm trying to, to say here. And if you didn't like my visualization, um, you can also like, show this in, in math. So this function phi is convex for positive values. So that means that Jensen's inequality applies. And you can just plug in the numbers and see that the expectation over 1 over h hat is larger than 1 over h, which is exactly what I claim in this visualization. So this means, due to the uncertainty in our curvature estimate, our Newton step is going to be too large in expectation. And this also transfers to the multidimensional case. <coughs> So the bias can, can affect different direction, directions very differently. So if we take a look at the 2D visualization, <coughs> imagine we are um, right here. And basically, we're going to move in two directions. We're going to move into a high curvature direction, and we're going to move into a low curvature direction when we apply the new step. And the high curvature direction, so this direction, is maybe not so much of an issue, because here the curvature is large, which means that it's far away from zero. And in this case, this bias is not really present, right? The distribution, if we map it through um, this inverting function, it's not really changed much. It's not really uh, distorted. And we get a decent estimate of the inverse curvature in this direction. So maybe in this direction, our update will look fine, like this one. It would have the correct length, basically. Whereas if we have a similar noise level for a smaller curvature, so if the distribution gets close to zero and we invert that distribution, this bias um, can really have a strong effect. And our expectation, uh, in expectation, our step is going to be too large. So we're going to have a situation maybe something like this, where the update in this direction is going to be too large. So if we construct the Newton step from those two components, basically, which, um, yeah, uh, it will result in a step that looks like this. And this step is certainly not ideal, because you can clearly see that we overstep the minimum by a lot because of this bias happening in the low curvature direction. So, so far I talked about biases because of those stochastic estimates. And now I want to talk a little bit about instabilities, but the argument is pretty much the same. So it can simply happen due to chance that we sample an estimate which is close to zero. And in this case, this small error in the curvature estimate is amplified by a lot if we invert it. And we just get a step which is basically arbitrarily large. So this can cause an unstable step if we just are unlucky with our sample. And if this only happens in one direction, it messes up the entire step. So you saw on the slide before, um, we can have an, a decent update in one direction, but if we screw up in another direction, the entire step, step doesn't make sense anymore. So one, I don't want to call it solution, but one way to um, to uh, um, yeah, maybe soften this, these biases and instabilities a little bit is applying damping. So um, remember that damping was basically adding an, a constant to uh, the curvature, which means in this situation we are going to move this um, 
we're going to move this green distribution to the right. So we're going to move it away from zero. And that means that um, yeah, the biases we make and the instabilities are not so much of a problem anymore because these happen when the distribution gets close to zero, right? So if we move it away from zero, we won't have these problems in, in the same extent. But there are certain uh, problems with damping. So first of all, it's just a scalar number, right? So it basically treats all directions equally. And maybe this is a little bit of, a, of an oversimplification to just have like one number and um, yeah, trying to solve all this complicated stuff that is going on with this one number. Secondly, it's adapted heuristically often. Um, so kind of as an auto loop optimization process where you consider those, um, those reduction ratios. And yeah, it would be nice to have maybe something that is um, yeah, smarter than that and maybe something that is also aware of the stochasticity um, that is in the estimates. So ideally, I think what um, we would like to have is not something that adapts the damping like in an auto loop optimization heuristically, but actually in the inverting algorithm have something that is aware of the stochasticity, aware of the uncertainty in the estimates, and then can decide for itself whether it wants to make, uh, whether it wants to make certain updates in certain directions or not to make them. I think this was, uh, would be more reasonable. So to answer this question, how to handle stochasticity, I think this problem is just fundamentally not solved yet. So my guess would be that we need specialized algorithms that are informed by richer quantities. So by richer quantities, quantities I mean um, distributions rather than point estimates. So if you had access to the screen distribution you saw in the visualizations, then you could actually maybe come up with a, a, a rule what updates to apply and what updates not to apply because you can reason about how uncertain you are about these updates. And with specialized algorithms, I mean algorithms that can actually use those distributions and like in the inverting process already use those richer quantities. So with that, um, this was the, the last problem we want to, uh, want to discuss. So um, the summary would be, uh, so last week we saw that training neural networks uh, with first order methods like SGD and Adam remains expensive, tedious, and brittle. I'm sure you've also experienced this in the, in the exercise. And second order methods, um, I think, offer a partial answer to that. So um, for example, in that they are robust against ill conditioning, but they come, of course, also with their challenges. So um, we talked about non-convexity, where we uh, um, basically have concrete answers, like uh, we can use um, positive semi-definite curvature proxies, like the GGN or the Fisher. We can use damping to make more conservative steps. The next problem was cost. So I presented BFGS, LBFGS, the Hessian free optimizer, and KFAC as smart ways to deal with this problem of huge curvature matrices and how to invert them. And, and they, they all come like with um, several pros and cons. And lastly, um, I presented stochasticity as the, a, a fundamental problem which is not solved yet. And, but maybe until then, I think curvature, of course, remains still a useful quantity. So uh, as I already mentioned earlier, Professor Hennig is going to talk about uh, uncertainty quantification and the role of curvature um, in this case. So with that, I'm done. Thanks for attending. Thanks for uh, answering my questions. And yeah, that's it for, for me. Thank you.